So we're in now Exodus, and we are live to the world. So um, we're in Exodus one. What's up, Brian? I'm still waiting. Oh, there he is, finally. <laughs> oh, okay, got gotcha. it. So um, we have. Uh, 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 let's see what our roles are. We have a narrator. Pharaoh and the midwives. Does anybody want to be narrator? Narrator again? Okay. Unless someone else wants it. Who wants to be Pharaoh? Oh, I'll be Pharaoh. Does anybody want to be the midwives? Ooh, that's a girl part. Mom, can you be midwives? Sure. Sweet. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, no. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Isaacar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Saphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that, <clears throat> so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies. Fight against us and then leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they put, they built Python, is it Python, Python, and Ramesses as store cities, as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields, in all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, When you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let him live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. <laughs> So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. I'm going to, I'm going to switch. I'm going to take over the narrator here. Okay. So this, this part, when I ran through it, it was confusing, but I made the chart for it. Now a man of the house of Levi, which is Moses' dad, uh, married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, which is Moses. When she saw, the mother, that he was a fine child, uh, the mother hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch, then placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance, so the, the baby sister, Moses' sister, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. So now we're switching over to the other side of the chart. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. 
She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. Um, does it, do you want to be um, Pharaoh's daughter? Yeah. Where? Uh, it's on 2 6. This. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying. Was like, this is one of the Hebrew babies. She said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter. And mom, do you want to be Moses' sister? Sure. Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Is that me? Mm -hmm. Yes, go. She answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her. That me? Mm -hmm. oh, I I was... Okay. Take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby. So, one line, sorry. So the woman here being Moses' mom, Moses' mom took the baby, Moses, and nursed him. When the child grew older, when the child Moses grew older, um, Moses' mom took Moses to Pharaoh's daughter, and Moses became her son. She named him Moses, saying... I drew him out of the water. Yeah. And Moses is Hebrew for to, to draw out. One, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating the Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way and that. And seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong. Do you want Moses there? Sure. Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Bryce, do you want to be the, the Hebrew? Sure. Cool then. Who um, made you ruler and judge over us? Are you uh, are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Troughs? Troughs? Mm -hmm. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue, and he watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, which is the Midian priest, their father, Ruel, asked them, uh, Nathan, do you want to be Ruel? Well, yeah. okay. so, so the first word is why. We're in a, you, you, you did an NIV, right? Yeah, yeah. We're we're in uh chapter two verse eighteen. Oh, thanks, man. Um, my app on my phone is misbehaving. Um, okay. Yeah, my, my connection in my room is pretty bad. So. Yeah, that's oh, there it goes. Oh. I got it now. Oh, cool. Why have you returned so early today? They answered. Um, this is girls. Uh, do you want to read the girls' part? Yeah. An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. I think and where is he? He asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershon. Which sounds like uh, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. Oh, I think I took your... Oh, you go ahead, you go ahead, sir. 
Oh, okay. I have become an alien in a foreign land. <laughs> During that long period, um, the king of Egypt died. Oh. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help, because of their slavery, went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now in three, we have we have a narrator, which I can be. Do you want to be Moses again? Sure. Cool. And then Bryce, do you want to be God? I always do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're always God from now on. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer. God said, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, mm. a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Levites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that uh, I, will, uh, I will have sent you. Hmm. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, What is his name? Then what, should I, what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you will uh, have to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. Mm. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land 
are flowing with love and life. The elders of Israel, oh, I think that's you still, right? Oh, the elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people so that when you leave, you will not go out empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and, um, and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and then to you, and then, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Cool. You, you guys want to keep going, or you want to stop there, and discuss? Doesn't matter me. What about these do, do you guys want to keep going or do you want to pause there? Okay, cool. Cool, let's let's talk about it. Oh, right, well, hold on, I got a question from Jared. So, Jared, on the poster board, that's a good question. What do you ask? So, Jared asked, um, hey, Chris, what is this on the poster board? So, Basically, um, when I started doing the post, when I read through chapter two, it was really like I missed it completely. So I put out to everybody in the narrative. There's, there's in like in a like three paragraphs. There's what is that? Eight characters presented immediately, and you know, it was my job to to cast roles and to figure out who's who and who was what. And I actually went back to the Hebrew and found that a lot of this, um, they have to assume uh, who did what. Because in the Hebrew, it just says, like, when Moses' mom was looking at Moses and he was a fine child, in the Hebrew, it just says, looked and fine-looking child. So it doesn't say who looked at the child. It might have been a group of people who were looking at Moses and be like, wow, this is a good-looking baby. Let's throw him in the Nile. Um, but uh, so within, within chapter 2, verse, within the first couple of verses, we have Moses' father, who is unnamed, Moses' mother, who is unnamed, Moses, who is named only after like the second paragraph, Moses' sister, who is watching him to save him, um, we have Pharaoh, the evil Pharaoh. We have Pharaoh's wife. Uh, we have Pharaoh's daughter who saved Moses. And then we have Pharaoh's slaves who came and, and uh, also helped. And so basic, basically we have God's lineage of people that he wants to be the ideal nation. But right now, because of Judas, Judas sins, because of the Israel's past sins, they're underneath this family line. And they're, they're, they weren't, God never intended that. And basically what happened is Satan used, Satan used them being in a weaker position above the nation. Well, these people, they weren't sold out to God. They aren't God's nation. You know, they don't have the lineage that they aren't God's chosen people. And so Satan exploited the fact that it's like, man, I could, I could get to these people this way. And so he convinced Pharaoh, who forgot what his parents did, and the big thing God tells us to do is to teach what the lessons God gave us down to our next generation. Um, he teaches uh, us to do that so that we don't have a son coming up to be bad to good people. And basically, God is now fixing this. And it's interesting to, to note that Moses' name, to draw out of water, it might also be translated to, to escape or to exit, kind of like the book of Exodus. So it actually can... I almost was thinking like the books of Exodus actually can call, be called the book of Moses. But I guess in reality, every time we read the name Moses, we can read the name Exodus. So. Any 
explanation. They've been waiting weeks to do that. <laughs> so, I, and uh, mom, mom, Nathan, Bryce, you guys can't see, but I made a little flow chart of like who all the characters were in Exodus chapter two on a poster. Um, I can see it. And I think, yeah, I think if I grab the camera and kind of zoom up a little closer on the Facebook Live. I see it from your uh, on lights. Oh, yeah? Yeah. There's everybody. It, I can't see it at all because I called in, but <laughs> I, will, I will watch the recording. It's, yeah, it's just a poster board with a bunch of printouts, but... Um, but it just helped me to keep the character straight. So, anyway, so do, does anybody have any comments on what we read? Now I'm getting seasick. Yeah, right. <laughs> seasick. You were running the camera up and down, and up and down. It looked like it was on a boat in the waves. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Moses felt in the in the tarred basket. Oh, that's yeah, that's very exactly great answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting A plus from the Bible teacher. Those flannel graph teachers were smart. Like I basically had to recreate a flannel graph, and if I had the flannel stickies, I would would have built a river, and they would have came and like this might have been the late eighties, but that was smart. <laughs> <laughs> really, really smart. Well, um. This one looks oh. really, really sunburned. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's not important. As, as in Song of Solomon, that's, don't look upon me. The sun has tanned my skin. I'm hideous. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so I got I did some cool research um, back about a couple years ago before my brain died. And, um, um, yeah, I'm just kidding. And, uh, so the burning bush, they, they actually, like, this is a mystery, but um, we know that through the history of the book, like, if there's not a, a spiritual reason that's named for something happening in the Bible, we can assume that there's a physical reason. You know, God uses science and nature at will to cause events and stuff. So there's not a spiritual reason the burning bush was burning up. So there's a natural reason they, they found, they think what they, and I believe what they found, um, when there's a volcano... Uh, that's erupting, uh, lava will come and 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 come come down and, and it'll it'll instantly turn a bush into like a hardened ash. And so they they've gone up and they filmed this. And I wish I could bring up another film of it. Um, but uh, it's a, it's a bush that's still completely intact, but it's and lava's running through it, and it's it's on fire and flames are coming out of it, but it's still intact. And so it, it is a, a rare phenomenon. But they believe that that mountain that Moses went up onto was erupting. And why you'd go up on an erupted mountain to check out a burning bush is it's kind of... God was probably drawing him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was doing. He just And then he had to take off his sandals. I bet that rock was hot. Anyway. The same thing about him. I know there is one thing that I was yeah. on also. Okay. What's up? No, I said there was one way. One thing that I had heard also is the fact that in the desert, because of the heat being so severe at times, that there would be bushes that would literally just kind of burst and then they burn out. But this one wasn't burning out. It just kept burning. And that would seem like an odd sight to him, so he drew his attention. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's possible that God had a bush light on fire and then just kind of reached his hand down into the bush and made it not burn up. Um, but uh, the text doesn't say that, and so we have to assume that it was a natural phenomenon that occurs. Um, so for that reason, I really was stoked when they found an actual bush that is on fire but doesn't burn up, that actually occurs naturally in nature. Um, God can do either which way. 
Um, but again, here, God, it doesn't say, um, you know, like we'll read further on in Exodus when God says, when God sends down the spirit as the 10th plague to kill all the firstborns in Egypt. Well, there's a spirit, there was a direct spiritual reason for that. And like in Job, God, God lets us know when there's uh, an actual reason, a spiritual reason for something physical happening. Here, 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 I would, I think that it, yeah, it's it's more a it's just it, there's probably just a burning bush the side of mountain from lava, but um yeah. That is a pretty strange phenomenon too, walking through the desert and then poof, there goes a bush. Oh. Well I think um that God uses that to draw attention, to get Moses' attention, but then also it's an exhibition of his power. Right. Which maybe Moses needed to see to have confidence. Yeah. In who he was talking to and what he was hearing or going to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I think you and Raquel are right in that God was drawing Moses' attention. It was very purposeful. He does that to us, too. Um, we'll be... Um, yeah. Any other comments on those? Any questions? Yeah. Um, there's also a note on 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And Bryce, maybe, maybe you've picked this up too. Have you ever heard anything on uh, on the section that says I am who I am? Gave himself the personal name I am who I am. So this is derived the Hebrew word Yahweh. No, okay. Huh. Um okay, yeah, that that's very true. Um you know, you're right in that uh, in, in Revelation um the gr the great I am, you know, we have a song the great I am. Um is is interesting to note in Japanese um, when you, Japanese and Hebrew are the same in this, is that when, um, 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 it's, uh, it's future and present tense at the same time. So it's, I am who I am. It can also be, I am who I will be. It could also be, I will be who I will be. Or it could also be, I will be who I am. Which is the same thing. That's amazing. Yeah, right. <laughs> I like the idea that the I am is because I am currently and I always will be. Yeah, I think that's what he was going for there. Never changing. Right. Yeah. What I don't get is why why did God come down as a burning bush instead of just as like like in his form right yeah yeah i think that he i think you were right in the the wonder element like here's a natural phenomenon we never see the bush is not burning up um just and then he, he just speaks through it like he's like hmm, let's see what it'll be like if i just talk through this bush yeah because i'm good yeah and and i think that that's a grace too <laughs> like uh to people because when when he shows himself you know like, who was, who was that, Bryce, you might know this, but who was that one person who he passed by? He's like, show me, it was maybe like Elijah or something. He was in a cave. He's like, show me your glory. That was, that was Moses. Oh, that was Moses, too? Yeah, when he said, show me your, for your glory. And he said, I will put you in the cleft of the rock because you cannot see my face. And he only saw his backsides. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bryce. Yeah. Because he would not come. He would not 
be able to necessarily come down. It's basically we just fry us. Um, you're walking into radiation and just literally fry us. Got it. Out of actual compassion would do more with how he did what he did. Yeah, and I think that there's um like he he's using the least amount of power to you know that was just what Moses needed at the time. If a if a bush speaks to me, that's good enough. Type thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember that though. I remember my friend when he told his um, testimony, Pastor Daryl. He said that when he when he died, he was sitting with God, and he knew he was sitting with God, but he couldn't see his face. Yeah, I've heard other people say that too. Yeah. Like they'll be turned around the other way, and they'll know he's there. Yeah. Well, the way I pictured it when he was telling his testimony was that he was sitting with him. He said that all the colors were different and couldn't even describe them because they were so beautiful that he couldn't describe them because they were colors from here. And that he was sitting with them just like in a field and he knew it was God, but he couldn't see him because it was too bright. Like it was like his face was just too bright or something. Yeah. Just the way Bryce described it. Kind of reminds me of looking at the sun. Yeah. Without the sun face. <laughs> yeah, until those elliptic ellipse came. I didn't know it was just this perfectly round yellow little circle. You know, I always thought, it, I don't know, I didn't even imagine what it looked like, but it's like, oh, you're just a burning planet. <laughs> so. Anyway, did anybody have any other comments? Um, oh, Jared, dude, you were on it, Jared. You're welcome, man. Um, Jared asked, what, what if the burning bush was symbolic, meaning how you could interpret it? Um, that's a that's a very good question. Where is symbolism in? And that's a good question for all of all of scripture. How do we know that this was literal? Does anybody want to take that? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just take it as this. Um, so God, when God writes the Bible to us, He uses things to speak to us as literal as plain as possible you know he sent his son in the human form um he uses the things that we know and that we see every day to 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 speak through out of his humility and and so um it doesn't say in the text that moses went into a dream and then in that dream god was speaking through a bush like if you read jared um if you read Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, the whole thing is crazy. And it is purposefully crazy because it's describing things that we can't see. And so in that sense, we are supposed to assume um, um, symbolism and things like that. But because there's not anything specific um, here in this text um, that's, that indicates that this should be read as symbolism, um, it's supposed to be read as just plain normal reading for now. Um, and, uh, and that's more easily told when we get to areas where there is, where it is supposed to be taken metaphorically. Um, can I use the bathroom? Yeah. There's a comparison of that the fact that was Jonah swallowed by a giant fish? Or was that symbolism? Right. Yeah, and again, that being there's there's no there's nothing in the text that indicates that we should take it as symbolism. Um, it says it, it, it's a literal fish where where some they they make the reader assume they leave the reader to assume that it's a a real physical literal thing, um, and it's and it's. Uh, you know, if you use that logic to its end, then the almost the entire Bible, like 99% of it, could be uh, just this weird interpretation thing. But no, there was a real historical Jesus. There was there there really was an Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham. There, you know, there there really are physical things that God uses, and He does that for our sake, for simplicity. He He could write an entire Bible, and the Book of Ezekiel is like this, and, and the Book of Revelation is kind of like this where the entire thing is just this esoteric interpretive thing that's very hard to get. And, and it's, it's actually less effective for us because we have to 
put a lot of effort into connecting the dots when it's not um, came from um, basically it was an evolved form of language once they go to um, once they stop using symbols and they what is it they call it an alphanumeric symbol mm -hmm. um, but one, once they stopped trying to draw pictures of things and actually created letters and the he the Hebrew language is a letter based system uh, but it th they they had to it's built upon, like languages are built upon each other. So the Egyptians were writing pictures, and then the in Aramaic, it's like half picture and half letter. Some of them are letters. So by the time you get to the Hebrew language, it's it's mostly letters. But if you take away the history of it, then then the Hebrew language would have been pictures too, because it's it's uh, just as the same way that technology progresses and builds up on itself. So does languages. So I think that. Um, but from what, what I've heard and from all the studies and what all the professors are saying is that um, Hebrew is from other languages that were picture-based. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. Right. And yeah, so it'll be a nice sleep uh, development and progress of written, written words. And yeah. Yeah, it, it, uh, it had to go through those stages. Oh, Jared asks, um, okay, I have found some scripture that I found was metaphorical, but it did not discuss it to be a metaphor. Okay, well, that would be uh, cool, Jared, if uh, you knew which uh, scripture that, that we could uh, talk about. Um, so, you know, you can post it here in the comments, or, or um, if you find it, just let me know, and we can discuss it next week. But again, that's a good question. What's when do we interpret something metaphorically and when do we not? Cool. Do you have any other comments? Jared, do you have any other comments? Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Nathan. Oh, yeah. I'll oh, just uh Moses was a handsome guy, but uh, he had a, a some type of speech issue, speech impediment of some sort. Um, that's what they say, yeah. Yeah. Moses. That's, that's kind of kind of interesting. I uh, mm -hmm. I had a speech impediment when I was growing up as a child. Yeah. And kind of kind of wonder what. Uh, what exactly Moses struggled with regarding that? Yeah, that's um, a good question. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, no, exactly. Did, did they ever name the Pharaoh? No. Uh, I, I had some extra downtime to look that up, and they there's. Uh, lots of candidates for that time period, but nobody, yeah. like I looked one up and the best candidate, he had a really short, prosperous reign, but then he died suddenly and had no kids. Um, and they thought that he was the candidate for Pharaoh. Um, and they also found um, 
that he had like a skin condition, um, which was indicative of possible plagues. But his picture is online in, in Wikipedia, and they found his remains. So it's like the they wouldn't have found that Pharaoh's remains, you know, washed away in the bottom of the the Red Sea. You know, it's a really large body of water, and they didn't have scuba right. gear back in that day. So it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I was looking at the picture, going like, oh, well, that's not him because I can see his corpse. Um, but uh, yeah, they they don't know. Cool. Any, other, any other questions, comments? Were you talking about how they actually found the the remains in the the Red Sea? Um, no, um, no. What Nathan asked was uh, which pharaoh was it? Um, they don't know. But... Okay, but didn't they? Didn't they find the remains? Like chariots and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Bryce. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me let me get back. I think here. there were many Ramses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So they they did. Uh, one guy did an excav excavation on the Red Sea, and the most evidence that they found um, there was a crossing where there was and and after seeing the I mean, this is like in the seventies, but he actually went out with a boat, went with scuba divers, and found remains of things of uh, chariot wheels of skeletons and things like that uh, kind of within a site that pretty well matched the description of the exodus red sea crossing mm -hmm. and so yeah uh, but the the most interesting part of that research because there have other people who've done research things like um in the Tehran, straits of tehran there's like coral reefs that connect uh, way across the red sea if the water's low enough it'll you can walk it um and archaeology have changed over time so it's hard to one of the most interesting things of that research done in the 70s was um uh it did fit the description of the tax fine uh it's a good candidate for where they cross the red sea but uh there were two poles erected one one on one side uh in the sand just a giant stone pole and it had no inscription at all and another one on the other side um, and it did have an inscription, and it's in like Saudi Arabia. And the Saudi Arabians took it away and locked it up, and so people can't just have access to it, which that will change. But uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's a lot of, a lot of information. Um. Okay, I found, so the transfiguration of Christ, Jared asks, did he turn into an actual bright beacon of light or was it a symbol about enlightenment of the mind? So I, I would say what's happening on the transfiguration of the mount is that um, people are going up on the mountain and they're seeing what I believe into the spiritual world. And so the spiritual world is described as very bright and colorful, like your pastor, um, or, or the, not pastor, but mm -hmm. the, the guy. Um, so it's yeah. described to be as a vibrant place, and the spiritual world is very bright. And when we die, it's not darkness. We're not a dead hunk of meat. We're, uh, it's, it's live and bright. And so in the transfiguration, it's not so much, um, it's not so much like, a state of mind in which they see into it, but they're actually seeing into the spiritual world, which is much brighter. Um, um, in the same way that God appears to Moses, he's bright and he's powerful. And if we see him, we die, we see God's face. Um, um, but yeah, that's, um, um, yeah, anyway, so should, should we close? We we done? We good? Mm -hmm. yeah, really Mom, any any other comments, Mom? Well, yeah, my my thing is always okay. This is uh, what I read, and now what this is telling about the character of the Lord, and how does this relate to me? 
Right. So, anybody have any ideas? <laughs> so, so the I think the emotional application here would be um, when we're oppressed and we don't see God doing anything right away. He does hear, he does see, he does come down personally to check it out, and he takes it personally offensive. When we're offended, he takes it personally offended. When we didn't do wrong, you know, and like Darren, with the guys at work who were offending you and things like that, God took that personally. You know, he, he went down, he researched it, and, and so it, it offends us, but as a father who cares for us, it offends him way more, and he does, like, change things around. Um, and in your situation... Uh, the guy changed his heart. You know, we were praying for that. The worker changed his heart, and so God, God does take notice. And so we're not, we're not alone when we're being oppressed. God does notice, and He does carry out justice. He does it in His time. It's usually a little bit later. And he doesn't stop it from happening. He didn't stop Cain from caning Abel, killing Abel. <laughs> no. no. I'm wondering if you're gonna catch that. <laughs> it's a new word. <laughs> I can't remember who did what, but uh, um, so, so yeah, he doesn't stop oppression from happening, but he gets mad, and then the anger of the Lord comes, and he who messes with us messes with the apple of God's eye. I think the other thing that's really encouraging is that no earthly human being, no matter how powerful their position, is an obstacle to our Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us mm. and will protect us and take care of us in all kinds of circumstances. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah, you reminded me of that verse in Isaiah which says, no weapon formed against you shall stand. Um, no, word, no word intended to harm you will um, harm you, will reach you. Um, he, he, God created the destroyer to wreak havoc, but he, he, he's ultimately in control. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I like, I like the, I like the, the backstory. I, I know that position was this for a time and a place. And, um, and I think that, uh, it's the same for, for all of us, um, uh, in our own, in, in, our own individual ways. Um, but, you know, Moses, the, the backstory of him, you know, going, growing up in Pharaoh's house and having lots of plenty, plenty of whatever he wanted, no doubt, and just lots of probably power, prestige, and then he has to leave that all behind. He has to run away to some foreign land. Nobody knows him. He's, uh, he's probably was uh, uh, hoping uh, to be able to find a place there, which tries to provide him a place to be. And then after so many years, God like calls him back, hey, you're going to go back to Egypt now and do this and that. It's uh, I just I just love the the thoughts there that in the ways of God, um, how how He does that. I think that it's important to remember in our lives too that. Our lives are somewhat of a story, and there are seasons and times for things in, in our lives, and that we shouldn't really think, think to ourselves, like, oh, this is it, this is permanent, you know, I'm just going to be a wanderer mm -hmm. in, a, in a foreign land right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and uh, you reminded me, Nathan, that... Uh, the whole reason he was fleeing is because he acted out of anger, and that's the same reason that the Egyptians, that that the Hebrews were in Egypt in the first place, because they got angry and revenged their sister by murdering. And like, even when we do mess up and we go and we be a wanderer and we're exiled, um, and even if we're in a bad place of life because of what we did, um, that he's always looking to draw us back to where he wants us into the promised land that he wants us in. And, uh, yeah, that yeah. gets to the heart. Mm. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, cool. Well, I guess if anybody has any comments, I'll close and pray. I'm good. You good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, God, we uh, thank you for your word, and we thank you that um, when we lose track, that, that you are always looking to bring us back on track, and um, in a prodigal son sort of way, we, um, we uh, um, you know the path that we go on, and, and nothing stops you, God, and uh, when we get oppressed and things happen, God, you do take it personally offensive, and you take it personally to come down and to right things, God, and so we thank you for your justice. Um, and your kindness and your goodness here exercised on earth and how much more so in heaven and, and how bright are things in heaven and so wonderful God. and so uh, we thank you for the trials of life which teach us a lot and at the same time we thank you that you never stop pursuing us and in the same way we, may we never stop pursuing others who are struggling and, and who need uh, who need you more than ever god um we thank you that uh, um, you are a loving father and we can be um, uh, a light because you you are our light, God. And um, we thank you. We thank you again for your son. Um, I pray that you would just bless us as we go on in our week and we go and do things for you, God. Um, I pray that you would just uh, keep that message on our hearts and, and may we carry that to others and reach continue to reach out to others, God, um, and forgive and move on. Um, when, when people hurt us and wrong us and uh, bring us continually to a better place in life, God. In your name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> what he said, well described. Good job, Chris. <laughs> anyway, all right, we're signing off. I hope last Sunday went well. <laughs>